Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with you know four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the Wild West here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California Gold Rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a doorstopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So. It's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course, outlaws all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' there were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That was a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena duels. So we talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began of course in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin, and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy, and then it gets really loud, really messy, and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd, of course, watches and places bets, which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a hell in a duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40 ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah. This it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. And finally coming in at number one, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane. I had to end with it. Elmer McCurdy, back in 1911, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather passengers. Collecting a whopping $46, which back then was still pretty good, he was quickly shot by a lawman afterwards. This is where things start to get insane. Yeah, I say start, 
Elmer's body was embalmed and sold by The Undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost, with his story attached. And for the next 60 years, his body, this prop rather, was passed around, sold between haunted houses and wax museums. Eventually, the guy's body, his real body, don't forget, ends up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Now, come 1976, there's a crew there filming for the $6 million man show, and that's when Elmer's finger breaks off accidentally. Some key grips like, whoops, revealing it was an actual mummy. They went to film the $6 million man and ended up finding the $46 man in real life. How gross is that? Kicking off the list at number 10, medicine shows. Nowadays, medical shows are fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I can weirdly watch that all day. There's something about animal rescues, home renovations, or chiropractic adjustments, you know. I can never be bored. So back in the wild, wild west, the 1860s to the 1890s, they had medicinal showmen. Yeah, these guys would go town to town, of course, selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail this pitch. They would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience for these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient, and then boom, just like that, they would be cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was an elixir made by Kickapoo Indian Medicines from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any illness, but really it was more of just a laxative, so you were just in the bush and hoping it got better. Number nine, hop on my camel, partner. When you think of the Old West, you think long open ranges, spurs on boots, and cowboys riding camels? That's right, in 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels to Texas. After all, the terrain in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when the American Civil War broke out. Eventually, the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends, such as the Red Ghost, a 30-foot tall creature that made people quiver in their britches. When in reality, most people had never seen a camel before, and it was just a feral camel wandering the desert. But I mean, who knows? If Star Wars had a 30-foot camel in the snow, what's to say there isn't one running around in the American desert? Number eight, missing mines. There's billions of dollars worth of gold lost at the bottom of the sea. It's there right now, waiting for you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. But if you don't have goggles, maybe swimming just isn't your thing. No sweat. Try the West. Whoosh. Yeah, there's dozens of lost treasure troves hidden in mines still to this day, like the San Saba gold mine or the wheelbarrow mine. There's a few we have heard from in literature from old maps, but none compared to the lost Dutchman mine. The legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, found the richest gold mine in the world. That's what he told his friends. And would we ever lie to our friends about gold and the location for it? No, absolutely not. The first gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock, had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father used it as a doorstopper. Yeah, they used a 17 pound gold nugget as a doorstopper. Nice. Back then, this information was game changing once they realized that it was, you know, gold. So Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right afterwards. I just wouldn't have told anybody. I'd be like, is this an affinity stone? I'm just gonna pocket this and then head out east. Head out east. Number seven, Sideshow Crook. Elmer McCurdy was no different in life than any other bandit at the time. What makes McCurdy so unique is in his afterlife. McCurdy met his end on October 7th, 1911, after local sheriffs tracked him down from a botched robbery. McCurdy was taken to an undertaker and prepared for burial. Unfortunately, no one came to claim the lonesome bandit. Not getting paid for his services, the undertaker began to display McCurdy as a sideshow attraction, charging patrons a nickel to view the bandit. The attraction became popular enough to draw the attention of carnival promoters, who offered multiple times a purchase just the mummified crook, but were all denied. As the years went on, McCurdy changed hands from multiple sideshow attractions and museums. One day in 1976, a film crew was setting up props for a filming. When someone began to move what they thought was a wax mannequin, it actually turned out to be poor old Elmer McCurdy himself. Eventually, McCurdy was laid to rest in a grave where two feet of concrete were poured over his casket to make sure no one would come to steal the sideshow crook. Stay in the hole, partner. Number six, cowboys and aliens. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico back in 1947, aliens might have actually visited us. Yeah, the report comes from 1896 from two men in California. They reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Were these just cowboy pranksters? Maybe they had a few shots of whiskey from the saloon? No, one of them was a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which honestly sounds like a wonderful time, just saying that. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender, 
aliens. Yeah, the aliens didn't end up taking the two men because they were too heavy. These aliens were too thin and weak. Legit, that was the reason. They just couldn't grab them and take off. So they got back into their spaceship and they took off. How embarrassing is that? Hit the gym, E.T. Number five, Romeo and Juliet. What's it a name that which we call a rose? Any other word would smell as sweet? It's often said that art imitates life, but sometimes life can be stranger than fiction and oftentimes really similar. The Hatfield and McCoys were two feuding families in the time of the Old West, whose hatred of one another runs deep. The most serious issues being family members removed, Old West style, by the opposite family. And in one case, a court battle over the ownership of a barnyard pig. But perhaps the best story to come of this feud is the love affair of John C. Hatfield and Rosanna McCoy. The two lovers met and instantly fell in love with each other, their families instantly disapproving of their newfound love. Similar to William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the star-crossed lover story ends in tragedy. After multiple attempts to rekindle their love, including a daring rescue organized by Rosanna to free Johnsy from her own family, their love never re-sparked, and Johnsy went on to marry her cousin. It's said that poor Rosanna died of a broken heart. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves my cousin. Number four, bank robberies. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, you need a hat, and you need a big sack with a dollar sign on it. Apparently, wasn't it like Bandit Central? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner in every dusty old town? Uh, no, there actually was very little, in fact. Bank robberies didn't happen that often back then. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were around 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. So it got a lot worse after the Wild Wild West. Now we're on like wild, 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 it's like 17 wilds at this point. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw, you may have heard of them, Jesse James and his brother Frank. This was in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. We know all these bandits, but it's like, they're just, they're just robbers, they're just bad people, we shouldn't really know them, or glorify them. But they do this, and ride horses, so it's kind of fun. And the number three spot, Good Bad Town. On your way out west, you may come to find that the unsettled lands are full of danger, bandits, crooks, perilous weather, and the occasional tummy ache. When the town of Palisade, Nevada's railroad was expanded and people began to arrive in droves, the town boomed, but so did their boredom. Palisade was rather mild compared to the rest of the expanding west, so much so that when tourists began to complain of Palisade being nothing like the dangerous towns they read about in their dime novels, the people of Palisade acted by staging fake bank robberies, gunfights, and even Native American battles between them and the army, with sometimes the Native Americans participating. Also going as far as using real cattle blood during the stage combat. The citizens of Palisade were such effective actors that a lot of tourists began to run back to the train in fear of what they were seeing. Nothing more American than capitalizing on boredom. Number two, Helena Duels. Have you guys heard of Helena Duels? They're pretty intense. They're a bit more intense than breakdancing battles, which honestly, it's pretty close, but these are like right above it. Helena Duels began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth. At least that's what they called it back in the late 1800s. It still is pretty close. The Hell in a Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They showed this style of combat in a pretty brutal cinematic way. Opponents' left hands were tied together with buckskin and each were given a small little blade. It had to be short enough so you couldn't reach any vital organ. That was the trick. It was a brutal detail that made this an unusual event. But just like the Romans and the Colosseum, everybody likes watching violence. Depending what era it is, people are like, yeah, we'll still show up and watch people die. Sure. People People would make bets during these duels. How did anybody watch these at all? I can't even scroll through Reddit at night without seeing something awful, let alone a Helena duel at like 4 p.m. And the number one spot. I don't like your snoring, partner. There were a handful of dangerous criminals back in the Wild West. This includes John Wesley Harden. Born to a reverend in 1853, his parents hoped he would grow up to be a preacher. He turned out to be one of the most deadliest outlaws to ever live. Harden claimed many lives over the years, but most bizarre was when he shot a man for snoring. One night in 1871, while staying at a hotel, Harden was having trouble sleeping due to the man in the next room snoring loudly. Harden promptly shouted at the man to stop snoring. Irritated with no response, he fired several shots into the next room, claiming the man's life. After years of being an outlaw and spending a lot of time in jail, he was released for good behavior, where he then received a full pardon. With his full pardon, Harden was then able to take and pass the bar exam, afterwards setting up a law practice in Gonzales County, Texas. If your lawyer has a longer criminal history than you, there's a good chance you're not gonna beat the case. Kicking off the list at number 10, going the distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s? That's why we clicked this video, right? That's all we wanna know. Some beers today cost like $13 at the bar. What's going on? 
Nowadays, we have happy hour, drink specials, wine pairing suggestions that go along with your meal. We have affordable alternatives today at the bar. Back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel to get there. Isn't that wild? In the Yukon, their shots of whiskey were like 50 cents a pop. That was, that was a lot of money back in the day. If you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, you could get numerous beverages for the same price. And as you would expect, the fancier the establishment, the more you'll spend. But either way, it's not gonna be comfortable. Number nine, manure everywhere. The 1800s were changing times, especially on the western frontier. Cities were being built, America was under reconstruction, and if you've seen my video on the 1800s technology, then you know how things were about to get a little wild. Except, something I wanna talk about today is, well, it's gonna drive moms and wives nuts across the country. How many times have you told your husband or the kids to wipe off their feet before coming into the house? Or stop wearing their shoes in the house? Right? It's the worst! I'm sorry, Mom. Okay, but imagine that, except everyone is bringing in their muddy, bloody, and manure-covered boots into the house. Horses and livestock were just a part of everyday life. That means droppings, or road apples, as they're so commonly called. The smell alone on a hot summer day could make any cowboy turn green. I think I'm going to pew, Dad! <laughs> Number eight, no stools. Okay, this one's for all the bartenders out there. I see you. I respect you. Bar seating is vital. You get your regulars coming in. Joan with the limp, she's so nice. She's always so nice every day. Always gets a grilled cheese. She's the best, always a smile on her face. Individuals who wanna grab a bite and read the paper, obviously they don't need to take up an entire table for eight, so you have spots at the bar. It's ideal, we're used to this. But back in the Western days, bar stools, just weren't a thing. Bar spots weren't, it, was, it didn't exist. You couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. They didn't have stools at the bar, they just had the rail at the bottom for your foot. Just that little bar rail there for the little lean right there. A nice cowboy lean. Yeah, I'll just eat fish and chips standing up leaning. Awesome, just the thing you want after walking in the sun all day long. A foot rail. Number seven, duels at high noon. Let me paint a picture for you, partner. It's a warm summer night, and you find yourself sitting at a card table in a saloon that's named after a barnyard animal. The piano is blasting a ragtime tune as waiters bustle about, serving drinks to unruly cowboys that fill the establishment. In front of you are three unsavory characters, each more than the next. As the night goes on, so do the poker chips. And when one gentleman ain't taken kindly to his losses, some insults about each other's mothers are exchanged. A powerful slap reaches the man across the poker table, matching the energy of Will Smith on an Oscar night. <laughs> Too soon? I don't know. Wow, wow, Wes. Wow, 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 Wes. <laughs> That's when it's settled. Tomorrow at high noon, they're gonna settle this like gentlemen. A duel at noon with, with guns, that's, that's how they did it. Does it get any more classic than that? I don't think so, folks. The clock strikes noon and only one outlaw remains. And he's married to Jada Smith. Number six, only talking. Ugh, here we go. You ever go to a bar, you're having a nice time, you and your pals order some Caesar salads for the table, the night is now well on its way. We're feeling good. Then 10 o'clock hits and you see a band start to set up. Okay, game time decision. Do we settle up and leave before they start? Or do we give them a chance, end up feeling bad, and feel obligated to stay until the very end at 3 a.m.? It's tough, usually the latter ends up happening. Back in the 1800s, we didn't have to worry about such an issue. Most of the time, these saloons were just for business. The odd time you would have poker, dice, a piano, perhaps, would be in the room with some jazzy fingers making an appearance. But when saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time it was for lawmen, miners, gamblers, just, just pure business. Not many blind dates happening in booths 16, you know what I mean? Number five, comfort of the ladies of the evening. Now being that it's the Old West and there was just a shootout in the street, folks need to take their minds off of such horrors. Add into the mix long hard days, tending fields and livestock, people need to take off some steam. The local saloon is there for that. However, like a hidden menu at McDonald's, there's some other activities a man can engage in that aren't perhaps a regular service. Aw, oh, who the hell am I kidding? Ladies of the evening were quite common back then, actually. Naturally, it was a very dangerous job. However, if anything good can come from that, it's that in some cases, these women became very wealthy. Wealthy enough to become the madam of their own establishments. And in some other cases, these madams were using their wealth to invest back into their towns, like building schools, doctor's offices. Imagine getting treatment from something and the doctor says, these bandages were brought to you by Madame Dover's Wicked Wizard Vacuum Double Sloshy Slush 9000. 
It's a great product, what can you say? Number four, interior decor. We've seen a Western saloon in movies. More often than not, it's the swinging door. You know, the classic, they always kick it in, boom, and dust everywhere and all over the place. Dust gets all on people's meals, the classic. You sort of need to kick those doors open, kind of, also. Because if you go through slow, it's just weird. It like pushes your clothes back. You need that cowboy momentum. In reality, there weren't a lot of swinging saloon doors. In fact, most saloons across the West were in pretty rough shape. They didn't look like a Tarantino set at all. They look like that one pub in that one town that one time, you know? Just not clean, not clean at all. You ride by, you're like, is that still open? How is that still open? These saloons were tiny rooms. We had stools or chairs made of fur. You know, no one's running fish tacos to tables in the 1850s. It doesn't always smell like a nice pub. You don't see something go by and you go, ooh, what's that? I wanna have that. No, that doesn't happen here. One of the fanciest saloons has to be the White Elephant in Fort Worth, Texas. It was two stories and it served fresh fish and oysters. Apparently it was a lovely time. Number three, manifest destiny. The destiny of America. There's a famous poster somewhere. It's like an angel guiding the pioneers west. It's like pointing, doing something like that. Back to the history. What is manifest destiny? Well, for our non-American audience, it was this very core belief that since America had won its independence and begun expanding west, that they were destined to do so and keep expanding and expanding. Why should the freedom train stop here, right? Coast to coast, baby. And maybe buy Alaska from Russia, since, well, they're not really using it. Okay, and maybe Hawaii. They, they got pineapples or something, I don't know. All right, maybe even heavily influence places that are beyond US borders. But all that American influence and imperialism starts here. Imagine being the pioneer who dared to venture west, like the Great Oregon Trail, or those who crossed the desert states. And some really religious folks that found a salty lake in the desert looked at their wives and said, eh, I need at least two or three more. God bless America. Number two, mixologist. You ever go to a pub, like a chill pub, dare I say a restaurant, and a dude with a mustache thinks he's in Peaky Blinders for no reason behind the bar? He's flipping bottles that don't need to be flipped. He's lighting shots on fire. Guy, it's 12.45 in the afternoon. What's your soup of the day? Where did this come from, historically? Where did the cool bartender role come from? I'm trying to order a Cosmo, but he won't stop doing stunts. In the 1800s, bartenders were referred to as mixologists. <sighs> Uh, they were top dog. They had to be. They were the fanciest guys in town. We're now doing impressions of these guys today, you know, with the bow tie and we pour it in fancy ways, because around the late 1800s, saloon owners were growing rapidly. So now you needed to have something special, something unique for the town. Like, say, a witty mixologist who can twirl his mustache as he pours a drink without looking. Great, now the town feels special, it feels unique. Manuals for bartenders came out around the 1860s, that's when things started to get more serious. A gentleman named Jerry Thomas published a guide called How to Mix All Kinds of Plain and Fancy Drinks. Today we still have that, but now it's a red sticky binder that says meal specs and Sharpie. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Number one, dysentery. Nothing is more horrible, more awful than catching dysentery. Trust me, I would know. I never caught it, I just, sometimes I get diarrhea. Anyway, in Oregon Trail, the very charming DOS game. Gotta love that DOS color palette. Eye melting scion and violet, nice. This text-based adventure game, however, is grounded in some truth, as we can all imagine this wasn't a time of great cleanliness. Dysentery, typhoid, cholera, malaria, or more commonly known as yellow fever, and even scurvy, which you usually associate that with pirates, but cowboys got it too. Which, given the conditions of the Old West, makes for a not so fruit friendly environment. So yeah, it does make sense. Sadly for cowboys, prospectors, and everyone in between, there was a good chance you would lay down with a headache and then the rest of your posse would have to lay you down forever. In the ground, partner. Starting our list off at number 10, a banker. Today, online banking is easy, right? It's a little bit too invasive at times. I don't know. I get an email from my bank. It's like, Mr. McWaters, do you want to provide for your family? I'm like, chill, relax. Back in the Old West, you didn't get a courtesy check-in email. You didn't have overdraft. In fact, the United States national banking system, well, it didn't even exist until 1863. Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And, well, these were pretty fun. Here we go. What they would do is wildcat banks, they would take deposits for a short amount of time, collect your life savings, and then unannounced randomly, they would disappear overnight. Just take all your money and then run for the woods. How horrible is that? Imagine going to the bank the next day and it's gone. The bank's just not there. You're standing there with a card. Like, um, hello? 
Where did I put this in? You're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? Fake mustache, oh hello sir, good morning. Stamping things that aren't even real. They did all of that and then they just ran away with all of your money. That's wild, I get it now, I get it, the wild west. After 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank, you know, and not screw people over for thousands of dollars. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these are all names that began because of these fake Looney Tune wildcat banks. So next time you see your bank call, be thankful. Don't be stressed, be thankful. They've got your back. They're not gonna run away overnight. Number nine, ranch work. Already, I can't do yard work. I don't know if you can tell by my physical being, but I can't lift a brick. My back doesn't allow me to reach the floor. A weird curve in the back, I don't know. Pulling weeds physically hurts my soul. Or maybe I'm just lazy. One of the two, I don't know. Either way, the Old West would have been the end of Taylor McWaters. To be a cowboy, it meant lots and lots of ranch work. It wasn't all yees and haws and kicking around. A lot of the time, you were protecting your cattle. That's stressful, right? All that meat just sitting there in the 1800s, good luck. Cowboys earned between 25 to $40 a month. Yeah, which sounds laughable now, but today that would be around $1,500 a month, which is fine. I mean, for a cowboy, I don't know, it's a bit, less than. Do cowboys get sick days? Probably not, they probably just get sick. Number eight, railroad work. This is one of the few jobs from the old west that I actively see every single day coming to work. Living downtown, they're always adding trains and bridges and not finishing any of them. And ideally, you don't want any toxic substance traveling down those lines, right? Fingers crossed. Well, back in the Old West, railroads were meant to assist the booming mining and ranching industries. Thing is, there weren't enough hands. There was not enough to keep up with the rate that they needed to. Like, who's gonna build a railroad? You know, who was the first person? Railroad workers, monthly, you'd make around $1,000, and this brought a wave of immigrants to the West. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, they all lay over 1,700 miles. Now, making this actual railroad, it destroyed the bodies of these workers, but without it, American history would not be the same. Couldn't imagine making a railroad. That is exhausting. Number seven, blacksmith. All right, close your eyes and imagine a blacksmith. Just any blacksmith from any time. Is he bald? Does he have a massive beard? Is he incredibly strong and wildly intimidating? Yeah, that checks out. That's what a lot of them look like. Missing teeth, banging something pretty loud. That's a blacksmith. Frontier times were almost a golden time for blacksmiths, believe it or not. Hammers, horseshoes, new railroads. It checks out. No, they didn't need any chain mail, but a saddle wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. We could use a saddle. They would earn up to $200 a day. Blacksmiths were always busy in the Old West. They doubled as auto repair services really at the same time. I mean, I don't know. A guy comes in with a busted up carriage. Well, now you're a mechanic. Yeah, go fix his wooden car. Good luck, you have one day. Here's 10 bucks. Number six, journalism. Believe it or not, the newspaper business cleaned up shop back in the frontier. Everyone wanted to know what the tea was. Tuscan, Arizona, for example, back in the day, back in 1831, that one town had five different newspapers. Yeah. Yeah, even though there are only 465 residents, there are five different papers. That's stressful. How do you keep up with that much news? I mean, to be fair, before radio and television, yeah, there's probably lots to talk about all day long. That's pretty much all you can do, just talk all day long, so I get it. The industry provided jobs as well. It's very much like YouTube. Here, there's writers, there's hosts, the design and print staff, we have editors. It was a little easier than laying down a railroad, that's for sure. So when it came to jobs, yeah, journalism wasn't that bad. Definitely better than doing anything that has to do with this motion, that's for sure. Number five, mining. A study done at a mine in Butte, Montana found that miners were dying from tuberculosis. A lot, like 10 times more than they should be. Not should be, but you get what I'm saying. The mining industry is crazy dangerous. Safety was often overlooked and the health of these miners was, well, non-existent at the time. The first gold rush was back in 1799. This kicked off everything. A young man named Conrad Reed, he found this bright yellow rock he had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, actually used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold, just keeping a swift breeze rolling through. It's worth a bit more than a door stopper today, and this actually ended up changing the entire industry. Gold mining got so popular that Congress had to build the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina alone. It's pretty cool. You have to make a mint? That's how much money you're making? Buddy, I want a mint. Number four, law enforcement. Of course, this too was a little different back in the Old West. There are not many body cams back then, I'll tell you that for free. Movies and television, they like to show the Old West as a lawless, rootin' tootin' time. And while sure, some of that is true, it wasn't as terrible as we think. Like a million ways to die in the West, Red Dead Redemption, it wasn't that crazy because before any formal law enforcement agency did pop up, everybody was a bounty hunter, right? Why not? There's nothing else to do. Go lay a bunch of bricks or go catch a bad guy. 
50-50. Both are quite dangerous. Eventually, positions like that of a US Marshal began to pop up more and more, and well, now there's a bit more order to the system, that's for sure. A bit, just a little bit. Number three, barkeep. All right, I love pubs, big old fan of pubs. I've never been to a Wild West Root and Tootin' pub, but I'm in no rush. They always have weird drinks like Venom Snake Juice or whatever, like Spider Ale. I'm like, I don't want any of these poisons. How about a beer? Just a beer, thanks. Bars in the Wild West, eh, not so fun. Not a lot of open mics going on back then in the 1800s. No karaoke night back then. See, back then, these saloons were just for business. That's it. You don't have a mustache and a business plan, ghetto. In the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel. Can you imagine that? In the Yukon, their shot of whiskey was 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day, but if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in, I don't know, Colorado, it'd be a lot cheaper. Pretty ruthless. That's rootin' tootin' ruthless. The odd time you would have poker, dice, maybe some guy at a piano with some jazz fingers, sure. But most of the time, business only. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, or gamblers. If you don't have any of those three, you're thirsty. Go gamble, go grab a dice and come back. Number two, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? Wonder, wonder where they all went. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's very gross, you're trying to bring someone back to life, I guess. Not really. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools in the West. Now, remind you, this was the late 1820s, so yeah, it was fine, I guess. This practice began in Edinburgh, Scotland. The medical science community was on the up and up, but in order to study new medicines, you know, to avoid the next plague or the next toxin rolling through your system, they needed these guys to come in and do the dirty work. Today, the medical community is a bit different. We're a bit, you know, smarter with things, but hey, never say never. A resurrectionalist might come back to life and be a new profession. How ironic. And finally, number one, medicinal showman. Ah, uh, yes, we'll end on this note. Step right up and see something that doesn't work. A fake product. Yes, here we go. I'm doing a fake shoe. A fake shoot? A fake show. I don't know. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen, right? You won't believe your eyes. Do you have uh, strep throat? Come on up. Here we go. Definitely gonna fix that. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, whatever. But it was all about the pitch. That's pretty much all they had. They would have pawns, like their buddies, run ahead into town and then plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient that he knew was there, and then boom, just like that, he's cured. Almost like a magic show, right? Some would think, full of lies. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was wildly popular. They toured with this elixir. They had to tell everybody in every town. They said it could treat any illness, but in reality, it was just a laxative. Just, uh, just a mess, just a show, really. So don't believe everything you hear, except for today. Today, we're a bit smarter. Back then, not quite. Number 10, diseases. Dude, I had a toothache the other day, swelled up immediately. I would never have lasted in this era. Unfortunately, everyone, it wasn't called the mild, mild west. And when people were sick, they got sick, like sick, sick. For instance, cholera, shared along the Mormon and Oregon trails, killed loosely six to 12,000 people on their way to the California gold rush between 1849 and 1855. It's believed that more than 150,000 Americans died during the two pandemics from 1832 to 1849. Yo, that is terrifying. So not only do you have to dodge bears and root canals, just washing your face in the local popular stream could get you, huh? The Great Plains smallpox pandemic killed more than 17,000 Native Americans within its first few months of being there. The American Fur Company steamboat pulled up and got off, coughed a bunch of times, and then people just unfortunately started dropping. There was never an official death record as smallpox decimated the Americas when it arrived both way, way back from the Spanish and then again from up north with the fur trade. Sneezing, coughing, everywhere, just cover your mouth, guys, you know? Number nine, kicked by a horse. Yeah, we've heard about this at some point in history, but did it actually happen? Like how often was somebody just so then that's it. Turns out getting kicked in the head by a horse back in the 1800s was like getting in a car accident. It was unfortunately, it, was, it happened pretty often, my friends. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Bill Pickett, just sounds like a Western man right off the hop. Bill Pickett was born in the late 1870s. He invented something called the bulldogging practice, which is to jump from the back of a horse onto a wild steer. Yeah, like you're Woody from Toy Story, just doing a heist, just jumping from one thing and leap into the other. Crazy. While your hat's still on your head, somehow. No idea. And there's many that attempted this and ultimately failed. Yeah, you can't wrestle a wild animal and then live to tell about it often. I've read it. 
Yellowstone National Park is apparently a hotspot. This guy sends me a link the other day. Yellowstone National Park, man gored in front of family. I'm like, okay. But even Bill Pickett himself got trampled and stomped to death in 1932. Holbrook Lynn, a Broadway star from the late 1800s, also met their fate from a horse accident. Malcolm Baldridge Jr., an American politician from the late 80s, rodeo accident. Yeah, brutal way to go. Number eight, wildlife. The Wild West was a pretty harsh time. If you were lucky enough to enjoy some peace and quiet away from the saloons and bathhouses and spend some time outdoors with the family, well, then you had to be pretty careful. I mean, I guess most of the time people were outside, you know, fresh air, birds chirping, and of course an array of vicious and deadly predators overpopulated and hungry. Dude, the grizzlies are named after the grizzlies, right? Like imagine all those horses you had to wrangle or the gators of the south just waiting for you to take a leak or pecked to death by these huge birds of prey. If you didn't have a rifle on you, something could get you. And that's all during the day. At night, laying on the ground on like a rolled up t-shirt, scorpions and coyotes. What were the bugs like? No muscle back then, just waking up stung to absolute by everything with legs. Don't even get me started on the snakes. Living in your boots or hat? I'm a pretty outdoorsy guy, but god damn. Yep. Number seven, the gallows. We've mentioned the gallows many of times here on Bumblebee. It's almost like humans are consistently cruel throughout history or something like that. Odd. When it comes to meeting your fate in the Wild West, it sounds horrible to say, but with the rest of this list coming up, at least being hanged was fast. You know what I mean? And in the case of Tom Blackjack Ketchum, it was historical in a historically awful way. After a train robbery gone awry, or as I've said for 10 years, Ori, Tom Ketchum was held in prison until his date with the gallows arrived. But while waiting in prison, this man gained weight. The guy was eating good. He weighed around 200 pounds by the time of his demise. And dark detail here, but his body was so heavy when he was hanged that his head just kinda, you know, I don't wanna say anything here on YouTube, but like his head, that's all I'll say, just. Number six, topicals. If we know anything about doctors from history is that sometimes they didn't get it right. Most of the time, super, super helpful. And then like sometimes, yeah, I have a cough. Here's some ammonia. You, come on, you can trust me. Just call me doc. You know what I mean? Doctors in the mid 1800s, wild, wild west times were just like jarring and bottling everything up. Everything had a remedy. There were coaches that would just sell topicals and ailments. Hair loss, here you go. Sore legs, here you go. Tuberculosis, oh yeah, sorry son, that's, uh, that's gonna kill you. We don't have a cream for that one. And tons of painkillers, of course, like opiates, morphine. Everyone's running around jonesing with cold sweats. Basically, you could just pull up to a remedies wagon and ask for either cocaine syrup or cannabis fluid or opium needles and be on your way. Every elixir, cure, and potion. This time literally went from medieval root canals to widespread vaccines in like 60 years. Pain leaves for headaches? Ooh, uh, I'll take that one, please. <laughs> Number five, weather. Weather, you wanna believe it or not. Try again. Back in the 1800s, obviously weather was a major factor, as it is today. Hailstorms, lightning, high winds. When you're a cowboy, this all sucks even more, honestly. Especially the opposite, when it's dry and humid for weeks at a time. Check this out. Wooden wagon wheels would actually shrink because of the heat. So they had to be soaked overnight just to prevent the iron rims from falling off during your commute during day hours. Yeah, it was so dry the wagon wheels needed water. Yeah, sorry I'm late. My wagon wheels were a little thirsty. Yeah, I had to wait for them to soak up some fun. I can't even drive a car downtown without having a panic attack today, let alone rubbing axle grease on my dry lips waiting for my wheel to drink water. Number four, gangs. If you've played the Red Dead Redemption series, then you've probably held up a train or two. Some of the posses that were famous at the time actually did that though and weren't so nice about it. The American West was made up of criminal outfits, usually a gang or a posse, involving members who would just live and ride and rob together with. Jobs were scarce and it seemed that it was just a little easier to just demand what you want and then enjoy the birth of all the media attention after, making some quote, famous. And obsession, the cowboy culture, the outlaw criminal. Some of them include Billy the Kid's gang, the High Fives gang, and the Oklahoma Braze. That's a good one. Artists were getting better at the time and people were sketching wanted lists for local sheriffs. These posters would be calling cards for these guys. They kept them, put them in their pockets as souvenirs. 
Charles E. Bowles, also known as Black Bart, held up a total of 28 stagecoaches without ever being caught, and even had the reputation of being a gentleman about it too. Emptying strong boxes, but never actually shaking down the passengers. There were even reports that he would even leave verses of poetry behind. Guy's a smooth criminal, huh? Number three, the night after. I'm sure the wild, wild west was wildly lonely. Definitely, this isn't news. Like Kyle said, we've played Red Dead Redemption. Just wandering around alone, sometimes you need more than a train heist, right? Sometimes you need love. Even if you have to pay for it with railroad bonds or whatever. Saloons have all the things a lone traveler could want, including STIs. Great, how much is a uh, great debit? We'll just pay for all this in one swift tap, I guess. The famous wild Bill Hickok, okay? He had a rough go. Guy had some troubles after a few saloons, okay? He was dipping around in a few bars and yeah. Alexander Fleming wasn't born until five years later in 1881, so penicillin wasn't around to save any cowboys at this time. Number two, battles. The archetype of the Old West period is generally accepted by historians to have occurred between the end of the American Civil War in 1865 till about 1890. The American frontier, also known as the Wild West, is the geography, history, folklore, and culture associated with the American expansion mainland that settlers started in the 17th century and ended in 1912. This era, giving rise to the expansionist attitude known as Manifest Destiny, which was the belief that Americans were supposed to travel and expand west. But with that came a lot of conflict. You can't just waltz in and throw up a house when someone else lives there already, you know? Years of warring tribes and bands, colonist battles, ego-filled duels, and the aggressive pillaging of land stolen took countless number of lives. Yeah, countless. Like countless, like we'll never actually know the accurate number. Roughly 750,000 lives were lost in the Civil War. Yeah, nasty stuff. And finally, number one, Helena duels. Beginning, of course, in Helena, Texas, Helena duels were Violent, awful. This activity came from what was then the toughest town on earth. And again, this is back in the late 1800s, so what that even means, I can't even compare. The Helena Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. It's not a great movie, but it's a history lesson in itself. A Helena Duel puts our opponents' left hands tied together, right? They're just tied together with buckskin or something that smells awful, and you have to just fight each other using one arm. Now, of course, in Western fashion, there was a weapon or two involved that I don't want to get too deep into on YouTube, so it got pretty gory, it got pretty violent. The only rule here was that they can't bleed too much. Awesome, that's a great fun rule, like whipping that one out on Saturdays. Hey, no one bleed too much or else, you know, then we gotta stop. I thought UFC was brutal, let alone a Helena duel starring Liam Hemsworth, of all people. Really? Starting our list is John Joel Glanton and his notorious gang. Like many Wild West figures on our list, he's got two pistols, a bounty on his head, and a long southern name. John was a soldier of fortune as much as an outlaw. Being an outlaw sent him running to Texas, where in 1835 he was living with his parents. It's during his time there that he marries, but it was a high tension time period with the indigenous people of the south, and he unfortunately lost his first wife in one of their raids. In 1849, he leaves behind his second wife, who said to be the most beautiful woman in the Republic of Texas, to ride out of San Antonio for California with 30 well-armed gold seekers. He used his hatred of indigenous peoples to fuel his bounty hunting and a gene to collect and trade scalps and skulls for money. By 1850, however, it became increasingly difficult for the Glanton gang to find bounties for indigenous people specifically, his sick preference, and the group began to attack peaceful agricultural clans in the vicinity of Fort El Notre. He even started to attack in in Mexican settlements in order to claim false bounties. His final escalation was when his gang seized a river ferry. While operating the ferry, they killed Mexican and American passengers alike for their money and goods. Ethnicity of the target no longer mattered to them, but thankfully they were stopped by the Yuma indigenous clan in the mid 1850s. What you reap is what you sow. These next escape artists were led by Judd Roberts. They robbed and killed an innocent rancher in 1885. Before that, Judd and his gang of four didn't really have much notoriety. They collected collected some bounties and they had some on their own heads. But they were never caught, always evading capture. Well, this time the Texas Rangers captured Roberts and one of his men. This was a time where hanging was the most sought after punishment, so Roberts and his cohort were put in the newest, most escape proof jail in San Antonio. They may have only just become known names, but their ability to evade and escape authorities was always acknowledged. A short time later, a third member of the Roberts' gang is captured and placed in a lesser protected prison. With only one man still free, it's no surprise that 
local jail immediately and mysteriously burnt down, roasting the desperado inside alive. After four months, Roberts and his cohort escape from the San Antonio jail as predicted, reunite with their third, and Roberts was soon stealing horses in the Texas panhandle once more. He periodically visited Williamson County to see relatives and friends, and Texas Ranger Ira Atten was dispatched to intercept him. After several clashes and near misses, the future Ranger John Hughes killed Roberts in the panhandle. Eyes, knees, fingers, toes. Well, if we're counting, Three Finger Jack had an obvious amount. Jokes aside, he didn't actually have three fingers. This is just one of those cool western nicknames on the list. A notorious Arizona outlaw, he'd been captured and jailed back in 1895. I guess prison escape was super easy back then because he busted out and joined the Blackjack Christians. He's in this gang until he meets Burt Alvord and Billy Stiles. It's hard not to be nervous around them after all, they were sheriffs, but only by day. In some strange twist, these two who you'll be learning about next were outlaws by night. Alongside them were their posse of four. During a train robbery in Fairbank, Texas, the train pulled into the station and as the crowd was milling around, the outlaws mingled in the crowd pretending to be drunken cowboys. Sheriff Jeff Milton was standing in the open door of the baggage car when the outlaws opened fire and he unfortunately was hit. While he was bleeding, the sheriff waited for the bystanders to clear and he fired back. Three Finger Jack was struck in the chest. As he died, Jack spilled the beans on his accomplices, which would be the ultimate snitch move, but also so that I can tell you the story of our next segment, which is all about Burt Alvord, the reverse Batman. Ah yes, a prestigious and respected sheriff. Burt came from the west with his father who was a justice of the peace. As a teen he worked in corrals and stables and even witnessed the famous shootout and, three years later, the execution of John Heath. Burt became a deputy to John Slaughter in 1886 and spent four years helping him track down thieves and rustlers. He became particularly adept at ferreting out information concerning the whereabouts of various fugitives, reportedly playing a drunk man like a fiddle. Alvar drifts into Mexico in the mid 1890s rustling cattle before becoming a law constable in Fairbank and then Wilcox, Arizona. It's here he becomes the Batman. Using his position and seeing the prosperity of criminals for so long, he masterminded a band of the best train robbers he'd ever met. Even after arrests in 1900 and 1903, Alvord and Billy Stiles, his deputy and accomplice, managed to escape a capture. When he collects a bounty too high to ever go unnoticed as a lawman again, shout out to Three Finger Jack above, Alvord spreads a rumor of he and Billy's death, even sending two coffins to the town of Tombstone. The scheme naturally didn't work, the coffins were literally empty. So Alvord is recaptured in 1904, but after two years in prison at Yuma, he was released and went to Latin America. He reportedly turned up in Venezuela and in Panama as a canal worker. Supposedly he died around 1910. The worst alias in the West award goes to Big Steve. Why? Because his name was Steve Long. Like if he'd been tall and skinny, would they have called him Long Steve? No creativity, these Westerners. No debate though, Big Steve was big. He was a whopping 6'6 and rumored to be three feet wide in the shoulders alone. His background is very obscure to us, but this Northerner established himself as a vicious gunman and La Marie. In 1867, he obtained the deputy marshal position and had a series of bloody gun duels within the first month. This grabs the attention of the Moyer brothers who had founded the town and appointed themselves the Justice of the Peace and Marshal respectively. Six pistols, one in each hand, the trio dished out justice in the back room of the town saloon, ordering ranchers to sign over their deeds to their lands and miners to hand over their claims. Anyone who refused them was killed, and between that and the crooked card games, that saloon became known as the Bucket of Blood. Meanwhile, a local rancher was beginning to form a vigilante group to put the trio out of business. One night after moonlighting as a thief, Long is injured by one of his intended victims. His fiance is dressing the wound when Long confides in her how he got it. She's disgusted and tells the vigilante group about his attempted robbery. Don't trust no, well anyways, the bucket of blood was stormed shortly after. On October 28th, 1868, the vigilantes proceeded to hang the men, but not before Long made an unusual request to have his boots removed. Why? His last words were, my mother always said that I'd die with my shoes on. Girl boss alert, let's talk about Miss Calamity Jane. Now that is a cool alias, and a definite upgrade from her original name of Martha Jane Canary, born in Missouri around 1856. By the time she's a teen, Jane's sharpshooting was the talk of the town, and she was the head of her orphaned household. Said to be a whiskey drinking, gun tootin' type of gal, she once even spat tobacco at the main actress of a play who is said to have done a terrible role. Jane worked hard and fought harder. She earned her nickname Calamity Jane when she rescued an army captain from his camp being attacked by indigenous clans. She's reported to have saved the lives of six stagecoach passengers in 1876 when they were attacked by bandits, and she even nursed people back to health during the Deadwood smallpox outbreak while cussing them. 
them out, of course. Having the reputation for being able to handle a horse better than most men and shoe like a cowboy, her skills took her into Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in 1895, where she performed sharpshooting astride her horse. Jane's struggle with alcoholism lost her this job, and then her following one at a newspaper. Finally, Jane returns to Deadwood, where she was recovering and tired. She works in a caring for the girls, doing their laundry and cooking until she passes. Though she married a man named Burke at the age 33, when Jane died in 1903, she asked to be buried next to Wild Bill Hickok. Rumor has it that Hickok was the only man she ever loved, and her wish was granted. The funeral was the largest ever held in Deadwood for a woman, and Calamity's coffin was closed by a man who, as a boy, she had nursed back to health when the smallpox epidemic took so many lives in Deadwood. His two passions in life were his mama and hardcore crime, Thomas Hodges and the Tom Bell Gang. He even started off as a doctor, all the makings of what your mama would want for you. Well, with the exception of crime, but hey, it pays money, so you know. Thomas started as a medical orderly in the Mexican War. He moved to Nashville to start his practice afterwards. Doctor life got boring, and when the gold rush was tempting, he set off to California, where he failed tremendously at prospecting. So just to become a thief, I guess, under the alias Tom Bell. He has an arrest in 1855, but escapes because I guess jails were unlocked buildings or something back then. He escaped with notorious criminal named Bill Gristy, a known thief and arsonist, and a few others. With their help, Hodges formed the Tom Bell Gang and began to prey regularly upon the Gold Rush area. Their fumble was killing a woman in an unsuccessful robbery attempt, and the gang was tenaciously pursued through the 1856 until Gristy was captured and spilled the beans. Before that, there were violent escapes from the clutches of justice, but because Gristy's information, Hodges was finally captured by a posse near the Merced River. He wrote letters to his mother and Elizabeth Hood, his mistress and partner in crime before his execution in 1856. Let's channel some Bonnie and Clyde energy by talking about Jim Reed. Good old Jim was born 8 miles from the Missouri Hamlet to a relatively wealthy family. At 17 he moved to Carthage where he had his first encounter with Myra Bell Shirley. The youths courted, but she was a few years younger and her father disapproved because of it, leading Reed to quite literally have a gun duel with Myra's father. Reed is forced to leave and takes advantage of the newly started civil war to join a guerrilla Raiders group, where he got a taste for lawless and reckless abandon after a life of spoils. After the war, he continues his reckless abandon. He killed two men in Missouri and fled to Dallas, and once again ran into Myra, whose family had moved there after he had, well, killed her dad. They became lovers once more, seeing as she already had a daughter from a past man who really cared about what happened to her reputation now. The two take her daughter and move and have another child together. This family of four pulls holdups around the state together for a few months before returning to Texas to buy a farm with their murder money. They could have left there, put the crime behind them, but instead Reed, Myra, and two other thieves break into the cabin of Creek Indian Chief Watt Grayson. He handled the government subsidies for the tribe, and Reed gang tragically tortured the chief until he tells them where they can find the rumored $30,000. For this and a variety of other misdeeds, Reed soon was hotly pressed by the law and he was forced to leave Myra behind. His bounty grows and grows as he loses control, and within a few months, a close acquaintance kills Reed for the bounty on his head. Let's follow that famous name up with another, Nat Love. He, like Geronimo in the next segment, is an exemplary historical figure that most people either haven't heard of or they don't know much of his story. Born on a plantation in 1854, Tennessee, Nat fought past the difficulties and challenges of obtaining an education while enslaved, and learned how to read and write as a child with the help of his father and literate people around him. Slavery came to a thankful end, but the strings attached meant that, like many others, Nat's parents stayed on the Love plantation and worked as sharecroppers. Teenage Nat worked in the stables and gained a reputation as a gifted horse breaker. He sold his own beloved horse to hit the big city Dodge, Kansas at age 16. Working on ranches as a literal cowboy and cattle driver, he lived an eventful life, having run into a cattle rustlers, enduring in inclement weather, had his horse shot out from beneath him, and even met the likes of Pat Matterson and Billy the Kid. Honing his skills on the range, he became an expert marksman and cowboy, and chose to test his abilities in the Deadwood Rodeo of 1876. He won the $200 prize money and prevailed in two shooting contests as well. It's a successful lassoing in a Bronco ride that earned him the nickname Deadwood Dick, which is hard as fuck. But in 1877, he has a unique cultural run in when a band of Pima natives capture him while he's rounding up stray cattle that happen to wander onto their territories. The Pimas had injured Love when he tried to escape their capture, but instead of ending his life, they chose to nurse him back to health out of respect for his African American heritage and the plight of his people, which they considered completely uninvolved 
involved in their battle against the government. Good old love got better and took off on one of the Pima's fastest horses, traveling over 100 miles bareback right into the arms of Alice Love, whom he chose to marry in 1889 and abandon the cowboy life for good. He died in 1921 at the age of 67 and wrote a memoir in 1907 you can still read today. The name that inspired many western flicks, whether old or new, is Geronimo. Unfortunately, most adaptions are incredibly offensive and inaccurate, and a lot of people don't actually know anything about the man and what may be the biggest scandal of the West. So let's learn. Born Goyacla, his story begins when Geronimo began inciting countless raids against the US and Mexican armies after his wife and three children and mother were by Mexican troops in the mid 1850s. Wild with grief, it's during an Apache tradition of grieving that he hears the voice of an ancestor tell him, no gun will ever kill you. I will take the bullets from the guns and I will guide your arrows. Well, Geronimo got his nickname for this exact reason. His ancestors promised that no bullets could harm him appeared to be true as he continuously escapes law enforcement, Anglo-Americans, and Mexican troops. He's wounded multiple times, but he always recovers. He becomes a newspaper sensation. The more often Geronimo is escaped and the longer he was able to disappear, the more embarrassed the US military and politicians grew by this scandal. After all, an indigenous chief and his clan were single handedly stopping the entire government from infringing any further on their promised territory, going against everything the government smeared about the indigenous peoples at the time. Geronimo repeatedly evaded capture and life on reservation. In his famous final escape, a full quarter of the US standing army pursued him and his followers and still couldn't make it. When Geronimo was captured on September on September 4th of 1886, he was the last Native American leader to formally surrender to the US military. He spent the last 23 years of his life as a prisoner of war, paraded by the American government for approved trips to world fairs and wild west shows like a display. He was even in attendance at President Theodore Roosevelt's inauguration, but Roosevelt refused Geronimo's plea to permit the Chickawagas to return to their native lands in the west. On his deathbed three years later, Geronimo reportedly told his nephew he regretted surrendering to the US. I should have fought until I was the last man alive, he told him. Geronimo was buried at the Apache Indian Prisoners of War Cemetery in Fort Still, Oklahoma, but thankfully had his body returned to rightful land. Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive. The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo and Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9. Gravedigger What does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the Old West were interesting places, where there were always two constants sand, and folks would probably end up in the ground, or that sand. So after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole. Or in these poor souls cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a gravedigger busy for days. However, I thank the gravediggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from Red Dead Redemption and well, the ones from Hamlet, those guys are pretty weird actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number eight, saloon owner. Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to one, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, 
you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kinda wanna be a barkeep now. Number seven. Lady of the Evening. I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hardworking men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Ooh. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings, that kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild wild west with a little girl power. Number 6. A Banker Look, it ain't really unusual, but you get shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon-wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home. Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kinda guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Number 5. Gambler You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed to want it big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft. That means another spin, baby! Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes! It's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number 4. Milliner Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, what if we employ someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number 3. Con Man You'll like this one guys, you're gonna like this one. There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries, there standing on a small crate like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <clears throat> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Bigger Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made from the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden currant, and as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and approved Vigor Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cures what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved Vigor Supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number 2. A Photographer Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. 
the high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. But that's boring. More excitingly, common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says wild wild west, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the old west. The life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String be in around to look for you, that's all I could say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. That's crazy, who would've thought? Let's prepare for some western lovin' by first learning the rules of courtship. A cool thing to know is that women had a lot more rights without needing a man in the western frontier. You could own a business, or land, or be a bounty hunter, or a sharpshooter, or just as easily be a brothel keeper or a grocer. Ladies had range. But there was still a ratio of like 90 to 10 men to women on the frontier, so the population had to happen somehow. Courtship required intent to avoid scandal. Young men, no matter how honorable a dandy or lowly a cowboy, must ask a young lady's male guardian for permission to court her. Courting held an inherent promise that said, we are spending time together to see if we desire marriage. To be courting doesn't mean you're engaged, but it did signal to all others that the lady was spoken for. Essentially, it was dating. Not this modern version that's been butchered by the last few generations, but rather what we saw in TV classics like Seinfeld, where it was casual and comfortable, no determination on land, Length, just seeing how you two fit together. Courting included meals with the woman's family, taking her on a sleigh or carriage ride, parlor games, reading aloud, and picnics were very popular, and courting actually made ice cream dates a thing. The Atkinson Daily Patriot printed the following ad on May 16th of 1881. It will also be in order to treat your girl to ice cream as often as once a month. Girls often exchanged things such as a locket, a coin, or even a bullet shell as a gift. If a couple was financially strapped, exchanging locks of hair was a memento as well. Oh, and also coffee. Cowboys sometimes hoarded coffee to impress women. You've learned the rules of courtship, now it's time to claim your lady by sparking and walking out. And no, that's not light a cigarette and leave the room. Sparking and walking out were acts of courting that signified deeper involvement. This is when we started getting to the relationship or engaged parameters. Sparking means to engage in courtship, but it was also a nickname for kissing in PDA, which the American West was considerably less prudish about than the East and South Victorians, seeing no scandal and a little touchy lovin'. This is particularly due to the scarce supply for women as forementioned. Walking out together is a little more like in the East and the South. Young ladies had a reputation to protect and parents will be parents, regardless of the time. Going on a walk or walking out meant that courting people could be in the public eye and therefore they could ditch a chaperone. Anywhere else this would have been a huge scandal, but on the frontier non-married couples would walk out in public to signify their claim and show mutual respect for it. Now anyone would know if someone was an unloyal partner and bonus, it's before you tie the knot. For a man to take his lady to an event, it could involve a lot of work. Ride into town, reserve a carriage, retrace the mileage back with the rig to collect the lady, then go back once more. That's a lot of time, labor, and dedication, and it's a true testament to the love many couples shared. Walking out remained a popular day even for the married. Gonna get down and dirty, then let's talk to it. Fun slang is up next. You and your lady done did your courting and are getting hitched. Time to impress her with some manly and sexy terminology. Cowboys had a way with words, so it's not too surprising that they use some pretty color colorful terms to describe matters of the heart, and that included courting. Getting hitched was a serious business, and spooning or sparking no less. The vernacular was different back then, and lots of phrases and terms used that were common enough that even if they sound gibberish to us, they were full of comprehensive sentences then. A bunch of these are actually still used casually today. From a list of dirty wild west slang, here's a few recognizable terms. Screwing, fooling around, painted lady, and knocking boots. To get the wrong pig by the tail is dying out a little bit more now, but essentially means picking the wrong person for something. Meanwhile, some more creative and lesser heard slang terms are perooting, which means intercourse. Spooning, unlike now, actually meant intercourse, not cuddling. And a California woman was a term for a separated but not yet divorced woman. Get the mitten was a playful way to tease your homie about getting rejected. For people with dirty mouths, they refused to get their mouths dirty. What do I mean? While some factors of the Wild West were a free for all, one thing agreed upon across the board of the Wild West was that oral pleasure was just a little too exotic. This finding is documented by Chad 
keeps novels slumming, sexual and racial encounters in American nightlife, 1885 to 1940, and states that the euphemism and cowboy slang for the act was the word French. It's not as if it wasn't anywhere else in the world or just had recently become a thing, the act had existed in many regions and goes far back into the BCs. It just seems that people in the wild west felt it was a little too European for their liking. In fact, oral was so sparse that even the painted ladies were against it, shunning other workers who performed it and refusing to associate or even eat with them. Well, it's time to get freaky deaky, so let's talk contraceptives. Because it wasn't going in here or back there in the wild west days, so ladies had an issue on their hands if they wanted to avoid a pregnancy but still wanted a literal romp in the hay. Especially since condoms did exist but they were super expensive, so people had to find out prevention methods. Pregnancy and childbirth were incredibly dangerous at the time, and with so few women it became a dangerous game to even get pregnant. In fact, many women on the frontier passed during childbirth. Women were often left with the choice of life ending pregnancies or noxious substances to prevent or diminish a pregnancy. These substances were also deadly and contained toxic ingredients, often from plant sources, that would end unwanted or simply prevent egg fertility. The long term side effects for where many women, especially those who worked in brothels and ingested these substances more frequently, would become infertile completely. Ovarian cysts were also a side effect, as well as hemorrhage or organ failure from overexposure to these poisons. It's sad, but in the Wild West, many women had to decide whether to have a baby or the high risk of possibly dying giving birth. Contraceptives, unspoken rules of oral, it seems like they could be hard to learn your birds and bees. So next up, the only way to learn was to learn by trying. That's right, the classic toss them in the deep end and watch them drown approach. Sure, you could get a vague idea as to what intercourse entails from living in towns that had literal brothels or semi-public intercourse, which we'll get to in a little bit, but it was mostly word of mouth or unhelpful packets called marriage manuals. These late 1800s safe sex brochures were laughably inaccurate and stressed the importance of only engaging in the activity during marriage. If you wanted to know anything beyond that, you'd have to learn by doing it yourself. As you've heard, it was pretty chill back then, so when it came down to some PDA and some romping, the whole abstinence pitch was about as useful as their killer contraceptives. There was no proper education on intimacy, which means not only did people not know enough about their parts, but they also had no knowledge of diseases that could come with them. These manuals also highlighted how self-given pleasure was unhealthy because of the use of human, you know, for anything other than procreation was frowned upon in the eyes of the Lord. This lack of education led to the use of their wily contraceptives and also the use of the next item on our list. Bundling. It's more than just getting cozy. An early custom of the Wild West, a courting couple who wanted to sleep beside one another but had yet to be married but still wanted to withhold from, well, carnal desire, they could bundle. It's exactly how it sounds. The courting people would literally burrito themselves in separate blankets or into a large fabric sack that tied around the neck and it would allow them to sleep sinlessly next to each other or even cuddle. Now, I know what you're thinking, Teresa, that little bit of material isn't going to stop no tomfoolery, especially once cuddles get into the mix. Rest assured, I got you, because for those who really were tempted, you could also have a bundling board come into play to literally draw the line. It's a physical divider placed down the center of the bed to keep unmarried partners from touching completely. No sleeping sack to sleeping sack action with a 2 by 4 blocking the way. It allowed the two to talk all night and even see each other's faces. Sometimes you could cuddle kind of over it, but no intercourse was capable. Both bundling options let couples experience physical intimacy before their wedding, and it was great for when you visited your lady and she still lived at home in a shared bedroom. You see where romp in the sack comes from now though? So how about after those I do's? It's out in the open. As forementioned, I would return to the topic of semi-public adult acts and here we are. What a fun place to be. You know what isn't fun? In the wild west most families lived in small houses, usually made up of one large room. So naturally when it came down to it, every member of a family sharing space, privacy wasn't very possible. Yeah, this isn't the fun and flirty voyeur stuff we were talking about, this is more in like grandma's range of vision. In this in this case, it's fair to question how they would get intimate when sleeping in a bed with other relatives. Having more space meant having more money, a type of privacy afforded by class. Money meant privacy, and in the Wild West, there wasn't much money. Meaning shared rooms or houses and finding strategic ways to get off in privacy. Author Brian Watson explained how the American West and North America as a whole went from a mindset of comfort to one of more sheltered as it is now. He cites that during Reformation, figures such as Martin Luther King created a sanctity of privacy surrounding intimacy, something previously non-existent. What's scandalous to us now was more normal to them than how we choose to live. Here's a weird one I didn't expect to learn about in research. Mail order brides. The Wild West had mail order brides. Yeah, 
Yeah, not something I would have guessed, but it makes sense. Female populace was next to none, and sure, with more men around than you can choose from, some were fortunate enough to marry good men and live happy ever after. But still, some other women found themselves in desperate situations that robbed them of their youth and sometimes of their lives. So male order actually benefited both the lonely prospectors and cowboys, but also the romance-seeking belle. One way for men living on the frontier to meet women was through subscriptions to heart and hand clubs, newspapers with information and photographs of women with whom they could correspond. Eventually a man might convince a woman to join him in the west, in matrimony, or a woman convinces the man. Social status, political connections, money, companionship, or security were often considered more than love in these arrangements. But some used these to genuinely connect and enjoyed a lengthy correspondence courtship. Some knew each other well and had courted prior to a separation or were connected by their respective families in different cities. We all have that auntie telling us she knows someone she likes for us. Although some matches ended in significant disaster, others yielded lasting contentment and happiness. In brief, amazing women left hearth and home and traveled great distances to marry a man and if they were lucky, it'd be one they'd fallen in love with through letters. And last but not least, homosexuality was no scandal at all. In fact, it was widely accepted, normalized, and not even questioned. Y'all think Brokeback Mountain came out of nowhere? Even though Victorians didn't write about it, homosexuality was very, very common then as it is today. But because the Victorians avoided the topic, Hollywood followed suit with depictions of the rugged cowboy and roguish western life that was simplified and manly. This modern erasure of homosexuality, as well as the racial whitewashing of the cowboy image, has long since been disproven by modern research. Our Archival photographs, memoirs, diaries, and more open attitudes have uncovered the shocking underworld of the West. Wild West society didn't necessarily label people as homosexual or heterosexual, but rather allowed each person to be who they needed to be in any given moment. With women especially not as present in large communities such as a mining camp, some men would fill the role of a woman for physical pleasure and domesticality, and normal gender roles were challenged. This was recorded in Alfred Kinsley's 1948 study, Sexual Behavior in Human Male. This same study reported the highest frequencies of homosexual intimacy to be among men in the rural farming communities and that cowboys and minors even often coupled up in unions known as a bachelor marriage. Part of this comfortable acceptance comes from the exposure to the neighboring indigenous communities where we've always acknowledged two-spirit, an indigenous exclusive multi-gender identity, or simply beyond the grasp of sexuality and gender labels. The concept of cross-dressing or same-sex partnership is completely normal. It's crazy to think how LGBTA people of the wild west may be quite scandalized by some of our modern world's present mindset towards them. First up, let's meet Pearl Hart. And let me start by saying that there's like three pearls on this list. Wild West was a big fan of that name. And Pearl was a big fan of the Wild West. She was born in Canada around 1870, and by 17 she was married to a gambler and on the train to the Americas, running from her terrible father and a life of disguising herself as a boy to commit thefts to scrape by. At 22, she attempted to divorce said husband to pursue further opportunities in the West. A total rider die dandy, Pearl's husband upped his life to chase her down, and when he found her, Pearl was already living it up with cigarettes, liquor, and even morphine. He won her back, but only before being drafted. After her husband left to fight in the Spanish-American War, Pearl, who was using her old cross-dressing ruse to commit thefts and crimes alike, met a man named Joe Boot, who was a career criminal. They robbed stagecoaches for a while before she was caught and jailed. Hart is famous for saying, I shall not consent to be tried under a law in which my sex had no voice in making. She was eventually released, to jail having helped her find sobriety new skills, a career, and how to read and write. But the rest of her life is kind of unknown. America was shocked and thrilled by the idea of a female outlaw, and Pearl earned endless infamy from the age of 19. And newspapers clamored for interviews with Hart, while Cosmopolitan, a new magazine at the time, was obsessed with her and often sent reporters to try and get quotes out of her. The Old West never saw another woman like her. And Pearl wasn't the only one taking advantage of male privilege. Meet Charlie Parkhurst. And from 1812 until their death in 1879, nobody knew Charlie was biologically a woman. There's no official documentation on what Charlie identified as personally. If they felt themselves to be a woman or non-binary or transgender, we'll never know. The story goes that while in the poorhouse as an orphan, Charlie discovered that boys have a great advantage over girls in the battle of life, and they desired to become a boy because of it. But what we do know is that times were rough for ladies in the wild west, so this Cracker Jack stagecoach driver decided to live most of their life as a man, driving stages for Well Fargo and the California Stage Company, pulling cargoes of gold over tight mountain passes and open desert. A constant 
constant danger from rattlesnakes and desperados. But Charlie had the balls for it. They're remembered as short and stocky, a hard drinker, cigar smoker, and tobacco chewer who wore an eye patch after being kicked in the left eye by a horse. Thus, their nickname, One Eye Charlie. Using their secret identity, Charlie was also a registered voter, and meaning they may have been the first American woman to ever cast a ballot, and nobody knew. After stagecoaching, industry began to die due to the railroads. Charlie lived out the rest of their life raising cattle and chickens until their death in 1879. It was then that their true identity was revealed, much to the surprise of their brooding and brutal friends. And then it was documented to the world in newspapers, many of which actually appreciated who they'd been in their secret, instead of belittling them in death. I'm sure Charlie would have loved to see that and know that. She's who you'd see in these old western films, Josephine Sarah Marcus. A smolderingly good looking actor born in 1861, Marcus ran away to Tombstone, Arizona while touring with a theater group performing and Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore. She stuck around to marry Sheriff John Banham. But two years later when notorious criminal Wyatt Earp showed up, well, her marriage went cold very coincidentally as she got all hot over tall, dark, and handsome Earp. Josephine and Earp fell in genuine love and she'd supposedly be the reason behind the famous duel at the OK Corral, a 30 second flurry of gunfire involving the Wild West superstars Doc Holliday, the Clayton brothers, and of course, the Earps. He, unlike many, was unbothered and actually more intrigued by her Jewish heritage. The Earps lived an okay life once they settled a bit, moving between mining and oil camps and eventually California to promote a movie about Wyatt Earp's lawman exploits. Unfortunately, Wyatt passes away before this is accomplished, leaving Josephine to battle it out with the studios and writers who take the original biography and turn it upside down. A commercialized depiction of her husband and an unflattering portrayal of her is released called Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshall. It came out in 1931 and fueled 50 years of Wyatt Earp mania, pro and con in print and film. Until she died, Josephine worked hard to have the correct documentation of her beloved life released. She passed away in 1944 and claimed until her dying day that Wyatt Earp was her one and only true love. Here's another one, Pearl Devere. She is one of the most famous madams in history. This red haired siren was born in Indiana around 1860 and made her way to Colorado during the Silver Panic of 1893. Devere told her family she was a dress designer, but in fact rose to fame as the Old Homestead, a luxurious brothel in Cripple Creek, Colorado. The price of a night's stay could cost patrons $250, which at the time was insane, but more so in comparison to how most hotels at the time charged about $3 a night. The building was reportedly equipped with an intercom system and boasted fine carpets, imported furniture and drinks, and chandeliers. As beautiful as she was sharp, the Rose of the Wild Bunch. Daughter to Germanic mother and Native American father, Laura Bullion faced discrimination and inability to fit in right away. But that's okay, she followed her father in the footsteps steps of career criminal. And while working as an escort in Texas, she becomes involved with Will Carver, who had been her married in uncle until her aunt's recent demise. Now widowed, Carver took 15 year old Laura to Utah with him, where he begins working with Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch in 1898, as does Laura. Laura Bullion helped the gang by fencing goods and money for them and was known to the group as Della Rose and often called the Rose of the Wild Bunch. Her affections also turned to Bill Kilpatrick, a member of the group, and they became lovers. Having taken part in several train robberies with the Wild Bunch, Kilpatrick and Bullion returned to Texas with William Carver, where Carver was ambushed and killed by lawmen on April 1st of 1901. Bullion and Kilpatrick then fled to St. Louis, Missouri, where they were arrested on November 8th of 1901. Kilpatrick was found guilty of robbery and sentenced to 15 years in prison, while Laura was sentenced to five. After serving three and a half of those years, Laura was released from Missouri State Penitentiary at Jefferson City, Missouri on September 19th of 1905 and lived the last years of her life in Memphis, Tennessee, under the name Freda Lincoln, where she was a seamstress and a dressmaker. She passed away on December 2nd, 1961, and is buried in Memphis under a tombstone that reads, Freda Bullion Lincoln, Laura Bullion, the Thorny Rose. Next, Mary Ellen Pleasant, the most powerful black woman in the Golden Rush era. Historians indicate that Pleasant was most likely born a slave, but got her freedom at an early age. She worked on the Underground Railroad as a young adult, ushering enslaved people out of the South and into the Northern states. Like many others seeking their fortunes during the Gold Rush, Pleasant and her husband moved to San Francisco. Here, she works as a cook and waitress and a professional eavesdropper. I know we're all taught not to be nosy, but Mary Ellen learned from the conversations of wealthy patrons, intentionally listening in for 
offered valuable information. She took what she learned and began applying it as banking and monetary skills that launched her immediately upwards. She took what she learned to help build a substantial fortune and eventually became one of the richest women in the city. Pleasant was an astute investor whose portfolio included real estate, railroads, restaurants, boarding houses. Pleasant's wealth, however, could not shield her from racism. In 1866, a streetcar conductor in San Francisco refused to let her board because she was black. Outraged, Mary Ellen sued, and the case went all the way to the California Supreme Court. In a historic decision, the courts ruled that segregation on streetcars was illegal in California. However, in return, the Supreme Court reversed the damages Pleasant had been awarded in a lower court ruling. You win some, you lose some, and sometimes you get both. And now it's Donna Barcello. Described as the supreme queen of refinement and fashion, Donna Barcello was a prominent saloon owner and a professional gambler in Santa Fe in the 1830s and 1840s. Barcello was recognized for her charm and sharp business skills, which helped her establish as an influential member of high society during the heyday of the Santa Fe Trail. In 1835, Barcello opened a hotel and casino in the city center of Santa Fe. The establishment encompassed an entire city block and featured lavish decorations including chandeliers, drapes, mirrors, and imported furnishings. The casino became a destination for local socialites and trail travelers for its opulence. Barcello oversaw the casino's operations and regaled patrons as one of the card dealers, widely known as the best dealer of the card game Monty across the entire Southwest. Seeking trade deals and investments that increased her wealth and social status, exercised economic and political sway, she made her fortune from real estate and gold ventures in addition to her casino. And when the American civilian government established itself in Santa Fe during the Mexican-American War in 1846, Barcella allied herself with Americans and assisted them by providing information and at times money. Accounts and representation of Barcella were often embellished by those who had labeled her the Queen of Sin. Barcella continued to operate her casino through the 1840s and died in January of 1852. Upon her death, she left several residences, properties, and fortune to her family, including two adopted daughters, in addition to substantial contributions to the Catholic Church and the city of Santa Fe to be used for charitable endeavors. Next up is Sing Choi. She's also known by the name China Mary and was an unofficial leader of Tombstone's Chinese community in the 1880s who supplied labor and opened laundries, restaurants, gambling halls, dens, and a general store. The Old West will always be remembered as an era of cowboy, but during its peak years, Tombstone was actually controlled by a female immigrant. She arrived in Tombstone sometime around 1879, and at that time, the Chinese population was 11 people, and she recognized the unprecedented profits waiting in the western boom towns. Mary's general store was in the center of Hoptown, a Chinese district of Tombstone. Mary's store dealt in both American and Chinese merchandise, and she gained a reputation as a universal accommodator. Everyone knew that nothing in Hoptown was done without China Mary's go ahead, and so she was held in the highest of esteem throughout Tombstone society. She was an organized and shrewd business operator who had an attitude that discourse was bad for business. Her private police force handled any problem that arose within her community. Mary enjoyed the highest of respect. As a result, she could act as a sort of intermediary between her community and other ethnic groups. She was the conduit that made cooperation possible. She was not only a cunning businesswoman, but a sympathetic humanitarian and calculating capitalist. Mary was a genuine immigrant success story. Even, even as a woman in the Old West, she wielded real power. She died in December of 1906 from heart failure when she was 67. Flesh is in the name and it's her game, Susan La Flesh. This is the story of the first Native American to earn a medical degree. Born on an Omaha res in Nebraska, as a young girl, she watched a sick indigenous woman wait all night for a white doctor who, after being called several times, just never came. The woman died the next day, and as Susan later wrote, she saw the need of my people for a good physician. Susan's father taught her her own culture and traditions and then sent her to the reservation's Presbyterian school where she learned English and then high school for further education to survive colonial society. She applies to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. It's a bold move on her part because even during this time, the most privileged of white women of America faced enormous backlash when attempting a medical degree, let alone a poor native girl. Despite this, she graduated a year early and first in her class. Rejecting a potentially comfortable life on the East Coast, she returns to the Omaha reservation and became the sole 
sole doctor for more than 1200 people across 400 plus miles and she was only 24 years old. She marries, she has two kids and she never stops. In fact she keeps going till she has enough donations and supplies to open the first hospital on a reservation that was not funded by the government. Unlike the absent doctor that she remembered from her childhood, Susan helped anyone who needed it regardless of race or ethnicity. On September 18th of 1915 Susan passes away. She worked hard to build a bridge between two worlds as her father advised and it was evident at her funeral. Three priests eulogized her but it was a member of the Omaha tribe who delivered the final words in the Omaha language. And now for the last lady on the list, Kathy Williams, who also went in reverse as Williams Cafe from 1866 to 1868 with the famed Buffalo Soldiers who patrolled the 900 mile Santa Fe Trail. She was the first African American female soldier to enlist in the army. She's the only documented black woman to serve in the army in the 19th century and she's the only known black female soldier to be a part of the Buffalo Soldiers. Post war job opportunities for newly freed slaves and for African Americans in general were non existent. So many had no choice but to turn to the military service for employment stability but also newfound access to health care, education, post war benefits by way of pension. Her enlistment starts in November of 1866 in St. Louis, Missouri. A cursory examination by an army surgeon should have outed Williams as a woman, but since the army didn't require full medical exams at the time, she was minty. Eventually, her third round with smallpox has a surgeon discover her secret in 1868. The post surgeon found out I was a woman and I got my discharge. The men all wanted to get rid of me after they found out I was a woman. Some of them acted real bad to me, Williams said. Once again, dressed as a man, Williams signed up to an emerging all black regime, the 38th US Infantry, which would eventually become part of the legendary Buffalo Soldiers. These units doted out the landscape of the American West and showed tremendous skill and valor in a range of duties. They fought in skirmishes with indigenous people, escorted vulnerable wagon trains, built forts, mapped the territory, protected white settlers, all with subpar equipment and a lot of racism towards them. In trying to make a life for herself, Williams could not have known her story had traveled. It landed with a St. Louis reporter and in January 2nd of 1876, edition of the St. Louis Times Daily, Williams officially became a headline when her story was published. Accounts say she died in 1893, shortly after being denied disability compensation required for her illness. Not for being undeserving of it, but simply because they couldn't grant it to her due to the fact she lied about being a man. Kicking off our list at number 10. Seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye Old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed. They have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so. Yeah, it was a rough time, either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice, which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone. They couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. 
Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral-B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings because yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old West. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today, we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet, or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the old west, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all, just a dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time, so yeah. I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy is, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like ax five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in like, there's no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil, that's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair, so that'd be a fun two-in-one back then, that's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up. Clean up top, it's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pipple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, bunch of bullshit. 
They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old West saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink. The cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that. Please put that back. Back in the wild, wild Western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some beverage like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're hairs. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour, come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. He's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm to grow it, thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the wild west, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. They didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you wanna call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and you know knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock, those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's, 
you're basically fucked more often than not. Starting our list off at number 10, no bar stools. This one here is for all the bartenders out there. Okay, bar seating is vital when you go out. It's the first thing that you see when your random party of 12 arrives and then asks for spots all of a sudden. So it's a little jarring to imagine a world where you couldn't sit down at a local pub. Yeah, standing room only. That's it, don't lock those knees or get too comfortable. You get your regulars coming in often, right? You got Karen with the limp, she's so nice, she's awesome. Imagine if she had to stand up the entire time. No way, get out of here. We have a booth just for her all the time. She always gets a grilled cheese, so nice. Back in the Western days, bar stools weren't a thing. In the 1800s, you couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. No, that wasn't a thing. They didn't have stools at the bar, nothing. Just one rail, just a bar rail to put your foot on and then have a weird balance the whole time. That's great, that's awesome. I feel like a cowboy already. Just a nice cowboy lean, that's comfortable. I'll eat fish and chips standing up, I guess. Let's move on. Number nine, medicinal showmen. Back in the Wild West, I mean from the 1860s, from the 1890s really, they had these medicinal showmen and it's exactly what you think. It's ridiculous. Step right up, you won't believe your eyes. Cough syrup. Crazy, right? So these guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail the pitch. I mean, that's all they had back then. There's no science to back them up. There's no Yelp reviews. They would have pawns instead, like their friends, run ahead into town and plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman, doctor arrives, whatever, he randomly picks an ill patient and then boom, just like that, they would be cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, root, and animal fat. It was said to treat any illness, but in reality it was only a laxative. What a fun show that is. Step right up. Not, not that close. Trust me, not that close. Number eight. Camels? That's right, we're not riding horses, we're riding camels. We got room for two people, depending on the amount of humps. I know they have one or two, depending on which, all right. In 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels into Texas. Yeah, why not? After all, the train in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East, so I guess it made sense. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when an American Civil War broke out. Yeah, a little bit of a thing happened there. Now eventually the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc and then so on and so forth. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends such as the red ghost, which was a 30 foot tall creature that made people quiver in their you know, britches or britches. I don't know what they say, jeans or pants? Whatever's Western, the Western version of pants. Trousers, that's British. Trousers is definitely British. It's not a cowboy at all. When in reality, it wasn't a monster, it was just a camel. But yeah, camels can be pretty frightening when you see just a silhouette. Again, with the two humps, it looks like a monster, for sure. I was a kid, I went on a camel ride once and I cried. Never doing that again. Also, that's pretty cruel. I'm not riding a camel. Number seven, going the distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s, right? What's this gonna cost? Some beers today are wild. I live downtown Toronto, it's crazy. Every bar I go into, it's insane. It's like $13 to get an IPA. It's like Gary's Rootin' Tootin' IPA. A pint made in-house with his bare feet. Tastes like a cup of nickels. Not a fan, not a fan of the IPA game. Today we have happy hour specials, wine pairing suggestions to go along with your meal, a lovely wine sommelier to aggressively tell you which bottle to get. But back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel just to get them. Yeah, what a weird system, right? In the Yukon, for example, their shots of whiskey were 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day. So if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, well, it'd be a lot different, it'd be a lot cheaper. If you kick the saloon doors open and you're out of breath, well, it's very clear that you've traveled a long way. Hey, this guy's out of breath. Let's charge him double for all of his troubles. Why not? Let's go, get off the floor. So out of breath, he's like, give me some water. How do they kick open saloon doors? They would just swing right back. They're not ideal doors to kick open. Number six. Missing mines. There's billions of dollars worth of gold just lost at the bottom of the ocean. That's fun, it's out there right now, waiting for you to go and get it. Right after you click that thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Right after you do those things. 
go and find that gold for us. But if swimming isn't your thing, eh, no problem. Try the West, plenty of gold out there. There's dozens of lost treasure troves just hidden in mines, like the San Saba gold mine, for example, or the wheelbarrow mine, for example, or more that I'm not gonna name because, well, maybe I'll go check them out myself. I don't know. None compare to the Dutchman mine. That one is very special. Now, this legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, he found the richest gold mine in the world. Now, that's what he told his friends. And would we ever lie to our friends about gold? No, never, okay? I certainly wouldn't. It's definitely real, man, for sure. First gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this big, shiny, yellow rock. He had no idea what it was. And for years, he and his father, John Reed, used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold. He just grabbed it, threw it on the floor, and then held his door open all day. Hey, come on in, here's company. Watch your foot over that big stupid rock. Back then, this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina. Cause yeah, people started to catch on how much it was worth. Put that in my pocket, thanks. Number five. Cowboys and aliens. Here we go, of course. Wouldn't be a Taylor McWaters list if there wasn't any alien nonsense. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico, which we've talked about plenty of times here, aliens may have visited us before. Yeah, old cowboy stuff. This report came from 1896, when two men in California all reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Yeah, it wasn't a sighting, they were trying to like, I'm trying to grab them and pick them up. That's terrifying. He's like, take my hat. One of them was even a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were both going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which sounds like a wonderful time. Sounds like a great fair. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender aliens. Apparently, that's pretty jarring. The aliens didn't end up taking the two men because, well, they were too heavy and well, one's a colonel, so he probably, you know, gave a nice left hook or something. But they said they fought off these aliens. That was their legit excuse why they didn't get abducted into outer space, because two cowboys fought seven foot tall aliens. Do we buy it? I buy it, I don't know. Why would they make it up, right? They don't know what aliens look like. Nope wasn't out back then. They have no reason to lie. They're just bored going to a saloon for four days. Yeah, it's probably fake, I don't believe it. Number four, old true crime. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, a hat, a big sack with a dollar sign on it, right? Wasn't it like Bandit Central back then? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner and every dusty town? No, there wasn't at all. That wasn't actually a thing. This wasn't the town with Ben Affleck. That's not a thing that happened. Bank robberies didn't happen back then at all. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. In total, that's it, eight. That many years, along 15 Western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States, which is a bit more. Right, just a little bit more. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank James. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Yeah, they probably got like $14. They're like, woohoo, we're rich. Number three, kicked by a horse. Here we go. We've heard about this at some point. People are getting kicked off of horses or by horses, around horses, or bulls. That's crazy. I don't know how people run with bulls. But did it actually happen back then? Turns out getting kicked in the head by a horse back in the 1800s was like getting in a car accident today. If you have a horse, it's... The odds are significantly higher. It's probably gonna happen at some point in some way, shape, or form. Bill Pickett just sounds like a Western man already, doesn't it? Bill Pickett was born in the late 1870s and he invented the bulldogging practice, which, bear with me, sounds a little worse than it is. The practice is to jump from the back of a horse onto a wild steer. It's like, you know, I guess it's cowboy stuff. There's many that attempted this move, this trick. I don't know, like a trick, like it's a skateboard trick. I don't know. Many attempted this and then they failed. Yeah, it's almost like you can't wrestle a wild animal and easily live to tell about it. Weird, right? I've read it, I've seen some things. But even Bill Pickett himself got trampled and stomped to death in 1932. Holbrook Lynn, a Broadway star from the late 1800s, also met their fate from a horse accident. Imagine that, it's headlines. Malcolm Baldridge Jr., an American politician from the late 80s, rodeo accident. Brutal way to go, these are wild. I did not know about a lot of these. There's so many. Look into them if you want. Such a grim list. Top 10 people that have been killed by a horse. I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Number two, business in the front and also the back. I love going to a pub, right? And right as the night begins to decline, 
a band always appears out of nowhere, right? You're like, yes, there we go. We have a band. Now we're staying for nine more hours. Let's do it. We have a night. Good or bad, we love a band. Play Shout, I don't care. But bars back in the Wild West, not many bands. Wasn't so fun. Not a lot of jazz going on in those saloons. Not a lot of open mics either in the 1800s. Turns out, that's uh, no fun. Back in the 1800s, these saloons were only for business. That was their sole purpose. You come in here, drink something awful, put that weird foot up, and make a deal. The odd time, sure, you'd have poker, dice to be laying around, a piano perhaps. Maybe some jazzy fingers would make their way in and quickly leave, I don't know, but it wasn't common. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, and gamblers. That's it. So if you walk in thirsty, they're like, eh, gamble, I guess. I don't know. That's, you're gonna have to trick your way in here. And finally, number one, the gallows. We've mentioned the gallows many times on here before, especially on Bumblebee. It's almost like humans are consistently cruel and awful to others or something. Odd. But when it comes to meeting your fate in the Wild West, well, it sounds horrible to say, but with everything else that we've heard, at least being hanged was fast. Being kicked by a horse and Whatever comes afterwards, probably not so quick. And in the case of Tom Blackjack Ketchum, it was a historical death. See, after a train robbery gone wrong, Tom Ketchum was held in prison until his date with the gallows arrived. But while waiting in prison, he gained weight. This guy was eating. He was eating good, apparently. He weighed around 200 pounds by the time of his demise. And dark detail here, but his body was so heavy that when he was finally hanged, his head um, left his body. It kind of like... You know, it popped off his torso. It's disgusting, but we have to end on that. I can't go from a guy losing his head to like camels. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. Number 10, dead bodies for entertainment. Now life sure wasn't easy on the frontier. If the dysentery didn't get you, there was always the chance you'd end up staring down the wrong barrel and find yourself in a hastily dug grave. Or if you were real unlucky, your dead body got stuffed and carried around the country as a sideshow attraction to get folk to spend a nickel to gawk at you. Wasn't too uncommon for sheriffs to pose dead bodies of outlaws like fishing trophies for photos. Imagine that on Wild West Tinder. Elmer McCurdy was one of the last famed outlaws who after a failed train heist found himself buying the farm at the hands of lawmen after a $46 take. McCurdy's body was taken from coroners by someone who claimed to be a friend but really, all they did was sell them across the country to circuses, carnivals, as the body of an outlaw that you could come pay a nickel to see. Eventually, McCurdy would end up in a Long Beach, California, where a TV show being filmed was using an amusement park as a backdrop. Set designers were moving a prop mummy in the haunted house, only to discover that the prop wasn't too much of a prop at all, but was the stinking corpse of the no-good varmint Elmer McCurdy. He would end up getting himself a proper burial after 66 years. Hey, you think your job's hard? Feller was working 66 years after dying. It's a living or a dying. Number nine, cowboy shows. Is there anything more iconic than the cowboy? The symbol of American freedom, manliness, and all things that made the West. Rough, rugged men with thick calluses from hard days work in the field, not sitting around playing pretend, except when cowboys would play pretend on stage for sold out audiences. Now there weren't too much to do out in the Old West. TikTok was just what you heard if you listened to a clock. So one way folks on the frontier really enjoyed passing the time was watching a cowboy show, where the slingers of western legend like Buffalo Bill would perform all their best tricks and recreate stagecoach robberies or buffalo hunts for thrilled audiences. Now these weren't particularly uh, uh, well-written shows or well-acted shows. These fellas weren't thespians now. They were men of the road. But imagine this sort of thing now. Imagine going to a show to watch a marine fire off a bunch of rounds and pretend to rob a truck. Be kind of weird, I guess. But that's what you do when no one's invented the internet. You get up to some pretty weird stuff. Number eight. Eating garbage. If you imagine the frontier, what kind of food comes to mind? Maybe a hearty bowl of chili? A nice stew cooked rabbit over a fire? Oh, you wish. Frontier folk had to eat whatever they could come by in a fork. As such, some Wild West tastes might not sit right on a modern palate. One Virginian cookbook from 1878 lists a way to prepare squirrel stew. And I ain't even gonna bother including the directions in case you wanted to make that at home. Cause just the idea of munching a squirrel makes me want to hurl. I suppose when you really come down to it, squirrel ain't that much weirder than a rabbit, but I wouldn't order it off the menu. Now, if squirrel stew ain't your cup of tea, maybe cooked calf brain might do it for you. Boiled brains of calves were commonly served alongside bacon and eggs as a breakfast staple. Other frontier favorites included son of a gun stew, which was a hodgepodge mix of all the garbage you wouldn't normally eat. Calf hearts, liver, intestines, 
tongue in a pot with onion, salt, and pepper. Mmm, my stomach's ringing. That's just like mom used to make. What's that smell? Let's continue on that last point about cooking, because I got a humdinger of a fact that'll make that last one seem downright appetizing. If brains and guts didn't turn you off cowboy cooking, let me tell you this. The Great Plains and the Frontier weren't exactly known for being particularly arborous. That's a $5 word that means there weren't a whole heck of a lot of lumber to make into firework. Not too many trees round in the desert. So if folks wanted to get a proper bonfire going, you'd have to get creative and use alternative kindling, namely uh, feces. Lots and lots of buffalo crap. Now if you're still watching this video and you ain't clicked out, let me keep explaining. It sounds horrifically disgusting, and I certainly would not recommend you use feces, should firewood be available. But by all accounting, prairie chips, as they call them, were plentiful, easy to find, and worked real well as kindling. They were quick and hot, and allegedly didn't smell half as bad as you think. But I'll take their words for it. I would not be surprised none at all if life on the frontier didn't burn their sense of smell. Living in a mining town was expensive. Now this might surprise you, but working in a mine in a mining town wasn't particularly a good time. It wasn't just awful and hazardous to your health, making your lungs black as midnight on a moonless sky, but it was also affecting your wallet. In fact, living in a mining town was more expensive than it was to live in modern day Silicon Valley. And cowboys don't even have the luxury of Uber Eats. You had to wrestle up all that food yourself. You think inflation's affecting your grocery bill now? During the gold rush, real shucksters would price gouge on everything. If your town was getting hit by that gold rush and prospectors were swarming on in, general stores would raise the price on everything to crazy degrees. For example, a carton of eggs from a flourishing store in California would run you $3 in 1951. Now that don't sound too bad, but adjust that for today's inflation, and that carton of eggs comes out to $105 for eggs. That better be the best omelet I ever had. If you knew you had loads of miners in town, you could sell shovels and pickaxes for basically whatever you wanted. You controlled the market. Some stores would sell shovels for $36, which would translate out to about $12 hundred dollars in today's dollars. No wonder everyone was robbing each other on the side of the street. The stores were robbing you blind. I'm doing the voice the whole video, editor. I hope you know. <laughs> the real number five, medicine shows. So after a long day being gouged at the market and eating bacon cooked over buffalo poop, you'd probably want to wind down and take in a show. Now I mentioned before you could catch a cowboy show, but if you were all caught up, maybe you'd want something else. What about a medicine show? Now healthcare wasn't much to shake a stick at back then. As such, it weren't uncommon to have a quack ride on into town and start offering a miracle cure for all that ails. Just a drink of this miracle solution and watch your health improve. You see, troublesome things like the FDA or advertising laws didn't exist way back when, so you could basically say your product did absolutely whatever and it was fine, and by God, you could put whatever you wanted in it. You've all heard the legend of where Coca-Cola gets its name, and I'll tell you, there's a reason for that. Over the years, the art of the snake oil salesman became a performance all on its own, an art form, if you will. Medicine shows would have events like burlesque dancers, dogs and ponies, a pie-eating contest, all to get sales through the roof, and it worked. These doctors would take in hand over fist. Way, way easier making money than robbing a train. You just gotta rob people blindly and tell them that you're helping them. Number four, watching a hanging. Johnny Cash shot a man just to watch him die once. If only he'd known that you could just head on out town square to watch a man die, could have saved himself those Folsom Prison Blues. In fact, I never understood why he was complaining about Folsom Prison. He put himself in there. It wasn't uncommon back then out in the frontier for a sheriff to try and swing folk into a good mood to try and make light of a bad situation. Supposedly it boosted morale around town if you watched an outlaw hanging from a tree. And dark as this is, it was a bit of a practical thing. There weren't nearly enough lawmen to stretch across the frontier, so if someone was causing trouble, oftentimes it was a little easier to string them up and sort all that business out later. Crowds would love this too. It might seem a bit uh, grim to you and me, but this would be a whole family affair. You'd bring everybody out to come hurl insults and throw vegetables at a local horse thief, and it was less like an execution and more like a sport, you know? Good fun for the whole community that brings everybody together. Number three, drinking poison. Poison. There are few western locales or imagery even half as iconic as the saloon. Imagine them doors swinging on open, a cowboy moseying on in looking to find out who killed his paw. The kind of place you could play cards and get yourself a stiff drink. A real, real stiff drink. Because if you drank what they were drinking back then, you'd be in a ditch with your eyes rolled back and the buzzards picking at your ribs. 
There really were not many laws or regulations way back when when it came to what you could serve, so bartenders got real creative with what they put in their cocktails. Old West drinks had great nicknames like Cactus Poison, Coffin Varnish, Tangle Leg, which all sound mighty appetizing. Or maybe you're fixing for tarantula juice. A drink sold in Sierra Nevada, which contained actively toxic poisons and wood grain distilled from turpentine. Mm. Goes down easy with a little bit of a kick. Of course, drinking this wouldn't just have you feeling silly, but it would also give you a sensation that you had things crawling through your skin, muscle spasms, locked jaw, but hey, it's still better than drinking Mountain Dew. Number two, crooks were celebrities. Celebrity worship ain't nothing new to the United States. America's always had celebrities. Why well, today we might be obsessed with troublesome bad boys like Kanye West. Back then, their bad boys and celebs were thieves, killers, and all manner of crooks. Legendary outlaws like Billy the Kid inspired fans the way we talk about celebrities now. In Kid's case, someone had published a biography about him not even a month after he was cold in the ground. Outlaws were romanticized like Robin Hoods, stealing from the wealthy and giving to the poor. This perception came from the fact that most outlaws came from pretty humble beginnings and turned to crime as a means of survival. Additionally, the harsh conditions of life on the frontier led to a natural mistrust of authority, which fueled admiration for men like this who stuck it up to the law. You'd read stories about them in the newspaper and books. Heck, you'd even get trading cards and notorious crooks with a pack of cigarettes. Of course, lawman got famous too. Wild Bill Hickox was a lawman and then he went on to do all them cowboy shows. Makes a lot of sense if you really think about it. These fellas were larger than life storybook characters, except they lived in your town and you could go and shake their hands and ask them about their adventures. Of course those people would become heroes. And number one, anyone could be sheriff. When you think of the Wild West and a sheriff in particular, you might rustle up the image of a square-jawed, handsome fella in a white hat that protects the people of his town from all kinds of evildoers. Well, maybe for John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, but the truth was sheriff was hardly the glamorous position the movies make it out to be. The sheriff was basically just a guy. Each state had their own requirements for being sheriff, and none of them really had anything to do with how equipped you you were for the job. Now, many towns were rapidly expanding and needed law enforcement, but there were very few formal qualifications for such a thing. As a result, many sheriffs were frequently untrained and inexperienced, lacking any sort of skills necessary to enforce the law. In some cases, sheriffs were appointed based on their political connections, ain't that the truth? Which led to all kinds of corrupt folk taking on the role of sheriff and using that power to benefit themselves. Heck, there weren't even rules about criminal records. You could very likely have a convict as your sheriff. In one infamous case in Bannock, Montana, their town's sheriff was allegedly running a conspiracy gang of stagecoach thieves on the side as a part-time gig from looking after the town. To serve and protect indeed. Hold on though, there was no law. That's right, how do you do a video on law when there was nothing written or upheld? After all, Constitution did not apply to unincorporated areas of the United States. The Code of the West by Zane Gray, published in 1932, revealed to us many of the unwritten rules of the West that had centered on hospitality, fair play, loyalty, and respect for the land, found in the 20 years that the Wild West existed. Ramon Adams, a Western historian, explained it best, saying that back in the days when the cowman with his herds made a new frontier, here, there was no law on the range. Lack of written law made it necessary for him to frame some of his own, thus developing a rule of behavior which became known as the Code of the West. These homespun laws, being merely a gentleman's agreement to a certain rules of conduct for survival, were never written into statutes but were respected everywhere on the range. The Wild West didn't have the judicial infrastructure we have now, with extensive police forces and crime labs and so on, owing to the vast side of, of counties and territories, both of which had their own law officers, and the fact that the officers from one jurisdiction had no authority in another, many of the crimes were handled on a citizen basis as Ramon described. So a respected authority would act as judge, a jury would be made, and a case would be determined off of witness testimonies. While their world was lawless, their job was nothing but OSHA and health and safety. The cowboy code. Yes, yes, it's not a law, but to cowboys in a time where there was no law, you either followed the generalized cowboys code I'm about to share with you, or you weren't a cowboy, just
just a jackass on a horse. These cowboy laws existed then and they still exist strongly today. So for all my frat dudes suddenly donning Carhartt, sideburns and crap kickers because of the western fashion trends coming back in, I hope you're up to snuff with these cowboy expectations. Like for no matter how weary or hungry you are after a long day in the saddle, you always tend your horse's needs before your own and you get your horse some feed before you eat. Taking care of one's horse is a core principle of horsemanship. Hey, grain and water come before beans, biscuits and coffee. Consideration for others is central to the code, such as don't stir up dust around a cock wagon, don't wake up the wrong man for her duty, etc, etc. Thou shalt not steal was written in stone and cowboys tend to honor this biblical principle with conviction. It goes beyond rustling calves, swiping the boss's money belt, or liberating a man of his prized saddle. Borrowing somebody else's belongings or riding their horse without permission is not allowed. Even invading their space is generally viewed as a form of larceny. On ranches where I've worked, nobody used your stuff, said Roland Moore, a veteran Montana cowboy in a 2015 interview. Your stall in the stable was always yours. The cookhouse was a safe place, so much that you could leave your money on the table and it would be there days later. And at dinner, your spot at the table always belonged to you. That's just the way it is. And on the topic of cowboys, how about the horse and cattle hustling, the then and versus now? Back in the 1800s, the report of a Texas Ranger captain on patrol with his company in the Texas Hill County Red came upon four cattle rustlers and four heads of stolen cattle. Final cost to state, six rounds. The penalty for cattle rustling and horse theft was always death if caught red handed. No need for trial, all that was necessary was to carry out punishment. Vultures and coyotes did the cleanup. Hell, in the cowboy code I just told you guys about, it states that riding another man's horse without permission is nearly as bad as spending a night with his wife. Nowadays, charges for horses or cattle rustling still exist. In April of 2021, the RCMP executed a search warrant on a rural property in central Alberta after an investigation was launched into stolen livestock from the Caroline area. Four stolen calves were located on the property, so the landowner was hit with five counts of theft. Also, I guess he must have been a character from Trailer Park Boys because he happened to have a stolen vehicle, multiple illegal weapons, was under the influence while driving, had a bunch of substance in the vehicle, and 12 catalytic converters. So, police solved a couple other crimes in this trip. And in 2009, Bill SB 1163 was passed by Texas Senate to increase the penalty for cattle theft in Texas to 30 degree felony to dissuade the excess issue. Montana's Senate Bill 214 also passed in 2009 and it required a person convicted of theft or illegal branding of any livestock to pay a minimum fine of $5,000 and not exceeding $50,000 and serve a jail sentence not exceeding 10 years. Whether illegal hustling or a cowboy leading the way, remember, no shortcuts. Long distance cattle driving was a tradition in Mexico, California and Texas and represented a compromise between the desire to get cattle to the market as quickly as possible, but also need to maintain the animals at a marketable weight. While the cattle could be driven as far as 25 miles in a single day, they would lose so much weight that they'd be hard to sell when they reached the end of the trail. However, sometimes shortcuts could be made, literally and figuratively. Cowboys sometimes were paid to sabotage a cattle drive or steal cattle. Sometimes they swindled cattle owners or stole the cattle themselves. Sometimes cutting through a path of land could get you somewhere faster. In these cases, it was accidental, but for many, the train and their tracks were the perfect for ridding themselves of cows. As a result of this behavior, nowadays a modern livestock code in Montana state legislature prohibits driving animals upon a railroad track. If a person willfully drives an animal onto the railroad track with intent to injure the corporation or the persons owning the railroad or animals and such animal is killed or injured thereby, the person is punished by a fine not exceeding $50,000 or imprisonment in state prison not exceeding five years or both. And they're liable for all injury and damage as caused by this occasion. A break from the animal talk will cover the West and women's suffrage. How a lack of laws in the West made it possible to limit oppressive laws against women in the East and America wide. The frontier lands weren't bound by the conventions of the Eastern parts of the United States. Past the continual divide, people were expected to dispense their own justice within communities. This also meant people were no longer bound by day to day conventions of life in established towns and cities elsewhere. And by people, I mean women. Well, predominantly white women, at least, it's always being the easiest for them. Women could own property, they could work as painted ladies or as madams, but they could also be law enforcement, bounty hunters and business owners. They could have their own home, they could divorce, or they could cross dress their way through life the way that Charlie Parkhurst did. 
The origins of the women's suffrage movement in America began in the West. Virtually all of the Western states enfranchised women long before the states in the East granted women the vote. Women's Christian Temperance Union was a huge leader in the women's rights across a variety of cultural, political, and social divides, leaning towards socialism and its belief that women needed legal rights in order to best fulfill their roles in home and beyond. Members of the WCTU, as well as Women of the Wild West, worked together to campaign for better working conditions, equal pay, voting rights, and end the exploitation of women. The work of the WCTU and the experiences of these Wild West women, especially indigenous women and women of color who suffered the worst at the hands of white settlers and worked the hardest despite, are important and led to the freedoms that we have now. And now a silly little interlude, the measure of a man should not be his ability to toss back some beers. After all, what constituted a man being old enough to belly up to the bar in the Wild West? Usually it was the judgment of the proprietor or the bartender. You guys know the one where they kind of look at you and they do the up and the down and the, you get all anxious. Billy the Kid was hanging out in saloons by the time he was 18. Billy Clanton was doing the same even before that. There are endless records of our most famous cowboys and outlaws getting tanked on the regular from a young age. But why? First off, alcohol was more common because it was a lot safer than water. Alcoholic drinks kept longer and it was easier to transport. It's been this way since medieval times, so no shock value in that. Beer was rocking a typical 1-2% to ABV, and it was the closest thing to portable water. When they were actually drinking to drink though, spirits was the choice coming in at about 15% ABV in the late 18th century compared to our modern day 40% ABV. Uh, one other thing, oh yeah, youth having a struggle or having an exposure to alcohol was a big reason that prohibition was finally approved. You know how a bunch of women were upset that their husbands came home drunk every day and that's how prohibition got its ball rolling? Well the men grew up in this era, or at least their fathers and grandfathers did, and as we know addiction is not only a but a genetic one, so even if they didn't partake themselves at a young age, their parents might have. This intergenerational trauma was inflicted by excess alcohol consumption in the Wild West and survived well into the more smoke and factories prohibition era. And let's talk about the law of the wanted poster, dead or alive. That can't be literal or real, right? Could you actually kill someone legally as long as it was a government poster with a cheeky red stamp on it? To answer your first question, yes, there are many known instances such as dead or alive posters being put up by the state or other entities, but it wasn't a get out of jail free card to kill the person without legal consequences. For example, Jesse James is death. Charlie and Robert Ford kill him, their own pal, but they went to collect the bounty and were jailed and put to death because witness testimony stated Jesse was unarmed, not resisting, and willing to go with them. To get away with killing a wanted person, they needed to be resisting in some kind of way, particularly in a way that threatened your life, aka self-defense, which wouldn't have been any different than if somebody attacked you outside of a bounty scenario. For quite some time in the US history, it was legal to use a deadly force against a fleeing felon, even if your own life wasn't immediately threatened. The logic behind this was seen that chasing down a fleeing person could be dangerous in unforeseen ways. It also incentivized criminals not to flee in the first place. These wanted posters still exist today and are used by associations such as the Mounties or the FBI or even the Supreme Court. A wanted poster can be a very important tool in seeking a fugitive. It allows law enforcement to make the public aware of a wanted person, multiplying the number of eyes focused on finding them. How do you get rid of indigenous people and pull tourists? Bison extermination mandates. Just to try and imagine the old west with no billboards, no power lines, fresh clean air, open and fields, nothing in the way of massive herds of bison. If there's anything to be said about the Americas, it's when we ruin something, we ruin it in full force. Bison, with an estimating range of 10 to 30 million, roamed America in the early 1800s. Then the Pacific Railroad was completed that opened up the West to a whole different kind of person, who were adventurous but still wanted to sit in a comfortable chair the whole time. Railroads would advertise hunting excursions in which paying customers would climb atop the train cars and aim down at the bison running alongside the tracks. No work involved, no danger for themselves, and hundreds of thousands of bison corpses are left to rot where they fall. One disgusting pig of a man or Re Orlando Brick Bond is credited with killing thousands himself. But the truth is most of them were killed by the people commissioned by the United States Army or the Army itself on their orders to do so. The American buffalo was a primary source of food and hide for indigenous people and the United States wanted to wipe us out. So they went after the buffalo in the 1830s and by the early 1900s there's less than a thousand left. Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo is a dead Indian gone, one colonel said during a hunting expedition. The policy was, if you saw a buffalo as a soldier, you were obliged to kill it. And now for how the West brought us the misfortune of botch, rinse, then reform. A death sentence is something most of us won't have to face in our lifetime, if you're lucky or not a terrible person at least. And a botched death sentence occurs when there's a breakdown in protocol. And that involves an unanticipated problems or delays that cause, or at least arguably cause, unnecessary pain for the prisoner or that reflect just gross incompetence of the executioner. It's an 
estimated that 3% of the US death sentences from 1890 to 2010 are botched, with the hemp necktie coming in at first. The tension of the rope or the strength is right. They were using a generalized scale that resulted in some hellish endings. The death of Tom Horn was retold in the saga of Tom Horn, and he was sentenced to death, but the method used to relieve him ended up with him suffocating for 17 minutes. The opposite happened to Black Jack, aka Tom Ketchum, the last man to be roped for train robbery. He fell too far, ending his life with decapitation. The New York Times says a reliable formula for determining the drop wasn't published till 1913, and with it came more humane standards for pre-death sentence, and the Wild West is actually the origin of prisoners getting to choose their last meal as well. And finally, no deathly duels is last in the countdown. Public offender, legislator, lawyer. Each of these professions needs to take an oath stating that they have never fought a duel with a deadly weapon if they want to work their job. In section 228 of the state's constitution, there remains a famous dueling clause. Since 1891, the Commonwealth officials have had to swear or affirm that they've never been in a duel in or out of the state or acted as a sect. Now why do we have that law still today? Well, in 1777, a group of Irishmen decided that the various rules and regulation of dueling published in European novels should be brought together in an updated manual, Code Duello. Featuring 26 rules for civilized duels, America won its independence from Great Britain in 1783. The newly reformed United States took a dim view on dueling. George Washington abhorred the practice. Benjamin Franklin said duels constituted as a horrible practice, but that didn't stop anyone. Button Gwinnett, who signed the Declaration of Independence, died in 1777 from a duel, and Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, died in a duel. By the first decades of the 19th century, dueling increased among the American upper classes. A new, more American version of the Code Duello, written by a Southern Carolina governor, Lyd Wilson, appeared in 1838. Knowledge of the code became part of the fashionable young gentleman's life. And with such history of, of glorification of weapons, it's no wonder that the state's fourth and present constitution retained the seemingly archaic clause against dueling. Kentucky lawmakers felt that an official statement in the Commonwealth's highest legal document banning would be elected officials from participating in duels would send a powerful message to those who might still resort to violence to settle disputes.